Lauren, uh, we at Indiana Center for Middle East Peace uh, are excited, and I'm personally delighted to be welcoming you here this week uh, for our program. So thank you so much for coming. And a warm, warm, uh, despite the rain, uh, welcome. I'm really interested in your story, uh, Lauren. Uh, foreign language teacher, Spain and France, uh, adult literacy teacher in Boston and in Boston and Durham, North Carolina, multi-faith chaplain. Uh, but already in the 70s, you earned a certificate in international mission. Mm. Um, so you, you must have had some sort of premonition or you felt a call. So I want you to talk about that. But also, what in the world uh, led you? To Palestine and Israel after such a full, such a full life already. Hmm. Okay, uh, let me go back. So my first career was um, in the area of adult literacy or language teaching, uh, teaching English to speakers of other languages, and I went to the school for international training, and after that uh, moved to uh, Spain to Barcelona and then on to Paris to teach. So I lived in Europe for a few years and came back to the United States just in time when the Vietnamese refugees were coming into the country. And I felt a real pull. I met Vietnamese refugees in Paris and I felt that this is the work I was supposed to be doing, not teaching businessmen English to make business deals in English and so on. And so I um, taught in Boston. Uh, I was um, part of a group of uh, teachers, scholars, following the work of Paulo Freire from Brazil, the pedagogy of the oppressed. Absolutely. And this captivated my heart and my mind and the connection between uh, language learning um, and empowerment. And, and so I did that for many years, and that led me to the South that you mentioned, Durham, North Carolina. I was the executive director of Literacy South. Uh, this was a well-known small organization getting research grants, teaching both teachers who were working primarily in the African-American community and then the incoming Latino refugees coming into the South and preparing teachers uh, to teach and also to be culturally um, bringing the American culture to the newcomers and vice versa. I did that while I was in North Carolina, and then I got really sick um, with something that uh, was diagnosed as fibromyalgia. I had a huge amount of pain and I had to stop everything. And during the year, what I call my desert year, um, I did all kinds of things. And one of them was I, I went to a psychic and um, spent 50 bucks. And the psychic said, somebody, I see you as a minister. And I thought, oh, this is a waste of money. Uh, why don't you go to a Reiki practitioner and that could help you with the healing? So I said, okay, I'll do that. So I went to the Reiki practitioner and had immediate healing. And I thought, what is this thing, this magical warmth coming from this woman's hands and she's like standing over there and I wanted that and so during the time that I couldn't work I apprenticed with her and I learned Reiki one two three I wrote down all of her work and went all the way to the master level and I thought I'm supposed to do this I'm this intellectual person but I'm called to do a practice that is just simply a laying on of hands and I started to bring it to the church, and people started to sit next to me, particularly old women with arthritis. And I go, honey, could you put your hands right here? How about right here? And then I brought my massage table, and then I was practicing, and the church saw something happening in me. And they said, you know, we don't know what's going on. We think God's got something for you. And they helped me to get money to go up to Andover Newton for a weekend to look at ministry. And I thought, really, I don't think I'm really the type. Uh, I haven't really even read the Bible from cover to cover. I mean, I did go to Sunday school. 
And, you know, I'm a little too eclectic, a little too outside the box. At Andover Newton, they had a Reiki ministry. Oh, wow. And I went in and I thought, oh, my God, I'm supposed to be here. The Reiki master at that time, who was teaching at the seminary, I think the only seminary ever to teach uh, this Eastern healing tradition. Amazing. She um, was my former divorce lawyer. And I thought, this is how God shows up in a very humorous way. So long story short, I said um, a wager to God that I say I either lost or I won. I said, if you want me, you're going to have to make some things happen. Uh, like, I have no money to do this, um, to bring my family back to Massachusetts and go to seminary at age 50. And I thought, I'm safe. <laughs> this is not going to happen. My aunt died that weekend in New York City. And turned out she was very wealthy. And she left some money for my siblings and me. And then I thought, oh, I should have put in the clause, don't take out anybody. But by then, I was out the door from the seminary with a little book on how to write eulogies. And I started seminary the following fall. September 11th, 2001 is my first day of seminary. And I thought I was going to become a professional chaplain. But because it was September 11th, Everyone who started seminary on that day, we're a marked group. And so my, I shifted and um, took in um, some of the different um, uh, certificate programs, particularly Boston Theological Institute. And so in addition to my Master's in Divinity, I have a certificate in World Mission and Ecumenism with just an inkling that I was being called to something bigger. I wasn't sure what it was. And then from the Reiki work, as I ended up being the Reiki master at Andover Newton, um, teaching people, I have a certificate in faith and healing. And, and so these forces sort of have always been part of me and then part of my ministry, a kind of prophetic call um, and also a pastoral. And um, when I was ordained in 2007, my mother said, oh, you don't fool me. You're the same person. You just have a different vocabulary. And she's right. I've always been an activist um, and engaged in um, politics. And then now I understand there is a faith connection for it. And, and so it's an integration, really, that happened. Well, you... You, you got me with uh, Reiki and uh, uh, Paulo Freire. Really, one of my Bibles really is Pedagogy oh, of the Press. Oh, yeah. Conscientization, right? Yes, that's uh, right. Uh, no, I love Paulo Freire, um, who just, was it this year or last, this year, the 100th anniversary of his birth? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's sent And he him. was out at the University of Massachusetts yeah. in Amherst for a while. Okay. Yeah. So, Palestine and Israel. So... How I got there was my mother died in 2010. She was a world-renowned watercolorist and traveler. And um, there was, again, a little bit of money from her estate. And I was trying to figure out what to do um, after doing my chaplaincy work. I had done that for many years. And a good friend of mine who was doing immigrant rights work with me said, has it occurred to you that God has another plan for you besides parish ministry? Because I was trying hard to get into that. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, 2002, I went to Palestine with the World Council of Churches to be a witness to what's happening there. And that changed my life. And that's ministry too. So I looked up the World Council of Churches. I looked up the ecumenical accompaniment program in Israel and Palestine. And I thought, my mother would be very happy that I was spending some of her money to go off for three months to do something useful in the world. So I had never gone on a delegation. I hadn't done any of the normal things you do, like, right. you know, well, here's where Jesus stood, and <laughs> Mary did this here, and I was um, part of, I think it was Team Group 39. Um, let's see what year. So it was 2011. And it was the Arab Spring, and I was part of the Bethlehem group because being a pastor, they wanted most of the pastor types to be in and around Jerusalem or Bethlehem. Yeah. 
And our job was to mostly stand at the checkpoint at 3 a.m. and monitor people going in and out and intervene if there was an issue. And that was harrowing experience um, to watch, you know, sometimes 1,500 mostly men crammed together like cattle and, and uh, the soldiers could do whatever they wanted. Yeah. Um, and, and so it was a pretty awful experience, but I fell in love with Palestine. That's what happened. Um, and I know this story from others. There's something about, particularly if you're um, of any faith, that this, our stories interconnect here, and they particularly interconnect in Jerusalem. And I remember one of my Palestinian uh, co-workers saying once to me, she said, you know, I saw you walking on the streets the other day, and you don't walk like a foreigner. You walk like you, you own the place. I said, well, I don't own the place, Ugh. but I am really comfortable here. I belong here. And, and so because of that, the global ministries, when they were looking for someone for the YWCA of Palestine, they wanted someone who was a woman. They wanted someone who's lived abroad. They wanted someone who knew about human rights and international law. And the EAPPI program, we were all about that. We were writing reports for the United Nations. Yeah. And so um, I was their perfect person, really, and a fairly good writer. And all of that is what I brought to them. And, and together, we did some wonderful work. I want to, um, I'm glad that that's a wonderful segue, because I want to ask you about the fabric of our lives, but yeah. put that on hold for a minute. Um, uh, first, tell us really, uh, uh, in general, about your assignment uh, as a mission co-worker and at the YWCA? So the way um, Global Ministries does um, uh, their work in the world is to assign, well, first of all, we give money and support where we can. And occasionally, uh, now it's, there's not a, as much money as there used to be, we send someone into the field to work with one of our partners. And, and that can be for a short, short time, uh, we've had missionaries in the field for years. Uh, I've had colleagues who live um, in East Timor, and they were there for 35 years. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So we, we've had people also in Japan um, and in Africa. This was a tricky assignment because um, of the uh, visa. Uh, there, in those days, there was this idea if you would go in and out every three months. Um, and so uh, what they didn't calculate, they figured I was this older person and I wouldn't cause any trouble at the airport. But because of my writing, I think, uh, as when I did the EAPPI, I had a blog, I think it was already marked. So I spent four hours in the um, airport before they let me in. And then they gave me restricted visa, saying I couldn't go to the West Bank, which is like where I'm supposed to be partly working and meeting delegations. And that's how I got to the Church of Scotland because I figured I need to be able to stay here. I need a clergy visa. So I basically said to them, I'll do whatever you want. I'll preach, you know. And, and I hooked in with them. I became an ecumenical partner with the Church of Scotland and also my work with the YWCA of Palestine, which was one of our partners. And Amira at that time was on the Global Ministries Board. And so um, that's how that happened. And I'll tell you about this fabric of our lives. That's yeah. my next question, so please do that. So the question was what to do with me, what kind of project would use my skills and help the Y the best. And, and so they were already in two refugee camps one in Ramallah, the Jalazun camp, yeah. and then down in Jericho. I forget the name of the camp in Jericho. Um, we'll come back. And the question was, what kind of advocacy could happen? Well, there's, for Palestinians, there's only one issue, and that's the right of return. And, you know, there's now seven, maybe eight generations of people living in these refugee camps yeah. and which we are working in. And so then how do we tell the story of 
Palestinian women. Um, and their story in particular from 1948. So now this is where it gets a little funky. So there's this uh, in America, these American girl dolls, these really mm. fancy dolls um, from different historical moments. And they come with a little book and little fancy clothes. My daughter had Felicity from Williamsburg. And I thought, you know, people love dolls and they like history. So what if um, I go and do oral histories of a kind uh, with women in the refugee camps? And what if we could make a doll in the embroidery of the village that they were expelled from? And so if you bought this doll, you got this little history uh, that went with it. And, and if you collected all the dolls, you would get more of the history. So that's how this happened. So my former life in literacy, I also knew how to do qualitative research and oral histories. So I knew the rigors of doing proper oral history. Would you like me to tell you about one of the stories? Sure. So um, the story that I will also share later is my first interview. Uh, because I came in, I had the little tape recorder, I had the notes, I had the translator, and, and you know, I thought I should be rigorous, I should do the same questions to each <laughs> woman, this is how mm -hmm. it works. And I come in and I see Miriam, Miriam. and she's a really scary looking person, very really gruff looking, and she pulls me to her and, and she, just, she just holds my face and stares at me. A little bit like what you did to start this program. And she just, <laughs> she, just, she just looked inside. And I knew she was looking inside. And I knew she was vetting me at some deep level. And I just stood there and hoped I was worthy. And then that was it. I was okay. We sit down. And I'm trying to figure out where's my paper? Where's the little thing? And she just starts talking in Arabic. And I'm like, okay, I'm not ready but I don't want to stop her. And she's holding my hand. So I swish the translator on the other side. So Miriam is talking. The translator is giving me, I have no notes. I'm like, oh my God, I can't even remember yesterday. And I have to remember a story in Arabic of which I'm getting like every couple of words in English. And I just hope I get the most important parts. This uh, is how I got Miriam's story. Wow. And um, I, do you want me to tell you the story? Let's save that open. later. Yeah, because yeah, that, open. but that whole process of listening, um, and I thought this is so um, unorthodox. You know, I've broken every rule there is about objectivity. And then I met a, um, a woman scholar, I forget what country it was from, and I told her, I said, I don't know if I can call this oral history. She said, you did a feminist oral history. I said, really, this is a name? She said, yes, you don't have to follow all those rules. You got the story. That was the main thing. So that's how I did all the stories. And the women opened up to me, and, um, and they told me what happened. And there was only one question. What happened in 1948? Yeah. And that's how the project emerged. So let me get this straight. So, you know, when I was telling folks that you were coming, I, yeah. I said, well, and Lauren, you know, inter uh, interviewed, you know, the women uh, f uh, about the Nakba, you know, Ramullin, Kalkili, and Janine. But you interviewed women also from villages that no longer exist. Yes. And I, so d did they make the, f so, I mean, th that's amazing in and of itself. Did they then do the embroidery? From those villages as well? Or no. So the, okay, I was, I was going to say, that would really have been amazing, No, right? no, the, the women's center in the Jalazun camp were already doing embroidery projects for the Y. They were making purses and things like that. So uh, what we did was I went to Mahasaka and, and told her, these are the villages that I need to know what the dress was and she made little models for us. And then the women could and couldn't do some of the things. So some of the things look a little different than they probably were. Um, and, and so the dress that was the hardest was we knew 
we had to also include Der Yassin. Yeah, of course. With a great massacre outside of Jerusalem. They were not in the refugee camps. So I found a woman in the old city of Jerusalem. And so the dress there is very different. It's a gold dress, I mean, white with gold um, threads, and this beautiful orange thobe, which people would know that's Jerusalem. And, and the women couldn't really do the thobe very easily. So I tried to get women from Beit Jala who know how to do this particular kind of stitching. Uh, so we did our best to be as authentic as we could on a little tiny sure. olive wood doll. Um, we had faces in the beginning, but then the marbling of the olive wood make it look like they had like a black eye and then they looked abused. And we thought this is not a good look for women to look like they got beat up. So no more faces, you know, um, that were sometimes okay and sometimes not. So now they're faceless. I'm wondering if there's a, a repository somewhere with those kinds of uh, the various designs from these villages, yes. these 430-something villages. Well, the Palestinian Museum outside of Ramallah, fairly new, I guess not so new now, it's about five, yeah. six, they had a beautiful exhibit uh, in 2017 or 18 of um, Palestinian thobes, the dresses from all over. Um, and a lot of women... Um, have held on to them, sure. um, and and it's a very special event when a woman goes to get her embroidered dresses. They're often inside out to protect the embroidery, and so they unfold them in front of you. It's very ceremonial, and if you're lucky, and they'll hold it up, and they and you go and you fall in love with the stitchery and the fineness, and and it's um, you're in when they have shared that part of themselves. Um, so the, yes, there, there are people who are collecting, Mahasaka being one of, of them. Course, yeah. um, so I learned a lot about embroidery. Would you like me to tell you about this? Sure. So this, what I'm wearing, is a cape from Gaza, from the refugee camp in Gaza. And they had help um, from the United States and in an exchange program, and so, a group of them were sent to the U.S. to work with Navajo uh, weavers. And so the Navajo learned Palestinian stitchery. And these women came back with some very unusual color designs. So part of what makes this unique is you, you won't see in Palestinian embroidery purple. Right. Um, and you won't see turquoise. So I've always wondered, did the um, Navajo start to embroider with a lot of red? because red thread is very important to Palestinian women. And a funny side note, when I was having a stole made for green, the color I wear mostly, every time I went to have it designed, they see green, they see black, they see red, and it's the Palestinian flag. And I see, oh, this is a Christmas stole, I can only wear it once. Right. And they went, oh, yeah, that's the issue. Uh, it's just, it's in them. And actually, that is one of the ways the women resisted when they, you couldn't show a Palestinian flag. They would use those colors in the weaving. So the men um, were being arrested for showing a flag, and the women are walking around pretty much wearing the flag, but not exactly. And, and so embroidery has also been a kind of resistance uh, to the regime of oppression. Fascinating. Um, I want you to take your, your mission co-worker hat off and put your theologian hat on now. Um, okay. uh, I'm going to oversimplify sure. uh, uh, because I'm going to leave out the theologies of the Melkites and the, uh, the Latin Catholics and the Orthodox churches in Palestine. So I'm going to put those okay. aside. But when I think of those theologies that are most conversant with us in the West, I, I think of three more, more or less. Uh, uh, what I call, first one, the evangelical Christ at the checkpoint kinds of theology. Mm -hmm. And I think of Mitri Raheb's contextual theology. Yeah. And then, as we talked about earlier, I think of Naimatik, Sabil, and uh, Palestine, Palestinian liberation theology. Um, uh, so to talk about, talk about your understanding of those three and... and um, how they're, how they're interrelated, but also how they differ from each other. Okay. 
the Christ at the checkpoint from the Bible College um, originally, and I think it's still true, um, realized that many evangelicals had, um, whether they were coming from the U.S. or anywhere else, had bought into a Christian Zionist uh, vision um, with a stress on end times. And, and that in order for Jesus to come back, um, the land had to be owned by the Jewish people. And there was this um, um, collaboration of, of Christian Zionism and Jewish Zionism. So they, I have a lot of respect for them on this level. They decided to really reform their own and to challenge them. And even the title, Christ at the Checkpoint, is saying Christ is in the suffering. He's not just at the end times. And, and this, for some evangelicals, was a huge shift to, to look at the, uh, the suffering Christ um, and not the prosperity gospel Christ. And, and so their conference was really designed for themselves, I think, to address this. And, and I have respect for that. Um, the Sabeel Center uh, of, um, and its focus on Palestinian liberation theology, most clearly articulated by Naeem, and a group of women that he worked with over time. I love the story at the beginning of Sabeel and when he was at the Anglican Church and how after his sermons they would get together and have coffee and discuss what he was talking about. Um, talking about cedar, I'm talking. Cedar Uebus speaks yes. to our groups whenever we go, and we just love Cedar Uebus. And Nora, and um, I'm forgetting one of the other. Um, there's three women who are very important to the development of the Sabeel Center. Absolutely. And and the the thing that I think um, is challenging. Um, in saying something is a Palestinian liberation theology when it is, we talked about this earlier, when it's compared to the movement in Latin America, um, there isn't really a, a close um, fit in that, in, um, in my view and for others, the Palestinian liberation theology um, from the Christians who are the remnants they're not the oppressed of the oppressed. They are at a higher economic level, higher social level. So one of the reasons liberation theology hasn't really developed there is because they're not suffering at the same deep level. The educated Palestinians um, theologically understand that they're all one and they have been part of the remnant, if you will. Uh, but I think um, it hasn't really developed into a whole movement. Yeah. And, and I see the struggle with that. And there are a few people who can really articulate. Um, so the context, contextual theology that Mitri does, it's not so different, I think, from what Naeem was doing. And I, I think that um, at times, uh, they were kind of competing for the same progressive uh, theological people, and they both approach it in uh, similar ways. One of the things that is um, really important to both is that when they look at Scripture, they pay a lot of attention to Jesus under occupation. Yeah. And so... And then you look here and you see, yes, we're under occupation. I'll tell you a, a little enactment I did and got myself maybe in some trouble. It was Good Friday. The streets were all blocked off in the inner city. And um, but This is where? In Jerusalem. And I was on the Via Dolorosa and we couldn't go down the hill because they said there were too many people. And then the, the guards, the border police, um, let a whole bunch of Jewish pilgrims go through because it's their Sabbath. And I thought, wait a minute, if we can't go through on our holy day because there are too many people, why did you just let them? And so they just said to me, you know, get back. You know, they didn't want to talk about it. So I turned to the little group that was gathered, about 10, 15 people, some Greek Orthodox priests. 
I said, well, this is great. We're having a reenactment, just like it was in Jesus' days, when the soldiers on the street and people were scared and, and they couldn't get through. This is so good. Let's give a little hand for the soldiers. <laughs> and so I, they did. And the Greek Orthodox priest said, very good, brilliant, but you need to go right now because they're going to figure out what you just did. A lot of times I felt that I was not living in Jesus' time, but the horrible interconnection of empire to empire. Yeah. And it has changed how I read scripture. So let's, let's stay with the theology. Okay. Uh, in the last decade, uh, the Palestinian Christian community has sent out numerous calls uh, yeah. to their sisters and brothers in Christ around the world. Uh, the two most important are the 2009 Kairos Palestine document, which was a yeah. landmark for Kairos Palestine, Kairos, uh, uh, Palestine and the Palestinian Christian community based on the 1985 Cairo, South Africa document, yes. but now part of uh, uh, the Palestinian Christian community. And then the 2020 yeah. uh, Cry for Hope. Um, these two seminal documents, What tell us what we need to know about them and what do they tell us, what do they teach us here in the West? So the first one that came out what was that? 2000, did you say eight? 2009. 2009. In fact, you and I met in 2014 right. at the uh, yeah. fifth anniversary. That's uh, right. Yeah. So I think the, the value of the first document um, is not so much even the writing, but the fact that the Christians pulled themselves together uh, from many different traditions and said, we must find our voice together to tell the rest of the world what is happening here and a call for action. And the BDS, the Boycott Divestment Sanction, um, had already been announced a few years earlier. And I think these leaders also felt the secular civil society had issued a call um, to use your economic leverage to end this oppression. And I won't just say occupation, and that's, I'm trying to remember this, when you only say occupation, you're starting at 1967 and you're really just focused on the West Bank. Mm -hmm. and, and so oppression is a bigger word. Um, and so I think it's really a value that they called for BDS then. It took the Western church a number of years afterwards to find their voice to respond to the Palestinian Christians in the UCC, we really have a very strong sense of partnership with um, people in the, in, around the world. So when our partners cry out to us and ask us to do something, we are obliged um, ethically to respond. And so some of the resolutions from different churches um, to use our economic leverage come in response to that document. The last one, A Cry for Hope, um, is just a wonderful wording right there because it's a cry. And it's a cry for hope that you will do something now. We cannot wait. And the Kairos is, is not Kronos time. It is the immediacy of now because they do feel that they uh, they may not um, be economically depressed, but they are small in number. And they are, uh, every year, more and more are leaving because they simply cannot make a living there. And, and so what's essential in this one, um, and I think, I don't think it was in the first one, is they also use the word apartheid. They call it out and they pick up the other thread that was in the first Kairos which is sin. And this comes, I know, from Mich Michel Sabah. It's, it's yeah. very deep in his theology. The, the Latin patriarch, the yes. retired Latin patriarch yes. now. Yes. And, and so for some reason, well, if not some reason, we in the United Church of Christ really heard this. And why did we hear it this time around? Because in our own country, racism has just gone um, 
it's always been there. It's out of the box. It's, it's everywhere. Um, Black Lives Matter. And I think we felt compelled to answer that particular call of naming the sin of what is happening and to include in that naming that this is apartheid. So transition now, you're, you're moving yeah. there. Transition to then uh, the 2021 General Synod of the United Church of Christ and the Declaration for a Just Peace in Palestine, mm. Palestine and Israel that picks up these two words, yes. sin and apartheid. So um, one of the key uh, writers of our resolution was John Thomas, who was very much responding to the cry for hope. Um, and, and so, but what we were all responding to, and, and he had to make a case to the Palestine Israel Network, the UCC Network, that this time around, we don't just do another resolution on this issue or this issue or annexation or that the whole thing, we've done a million, not a million, we've done a lot of resolutions. We need to go further. We need to do what the Lutherans did in Nazi Germany, what the Christians leaders in the Anglican church in particular did in South Africa. We need to confess our complicity in this system. And we need to affirm what we know in our faith. And because of that affirmation, we need to reject this. It's a completely different kind of resolution than I've ever seen in the United Church of Christ. And, and we worked very hard on it. Uh, right away in the vetting uh, process, we didn't know there was a vetting process, um, they flagged apartheid and made it take us out. And we, should we just give up? We care a lot about this. We rewrote it from the perspective of the Jim Crow South. We described apartheid in the United States. For some reason, they didn't find that problematic. They didn't see the apartheid word in the other second half of the resolution. It stayed in. And uh, when it was under discussion, before it went to the floor for a vote, they took out sin and apartheid. And we had a wonderful, theological, deep, soulful talk about what were we going to do, UCC Penn, how could we strategize to get those words back in? And we had to vote. If we only could choose one, it felt like a weird kid's game. Which one was most important? I argued for apartheid. And uh, actually, Ali, at that time, I think, argued for sin. She's right. In the chronological order, it should be sin. But I felt if a mainline church in the United States uh, could use the correct language to describe what is actively happening that our partners have asked for, this would be a significant win. And if we could get a second, then we'd go for sin. And that is what happened. Um, and so it, it has indeed become that. Many churches are asking us now when putting forward resolutions that pick up on these themes. I was, uh, a decade or so ago, I was in Cleveland with Jay Harder and mm -hmm. uh, some of the others uh, when uh, UCC PIN was created. Yeah. And uh, um, so, so I feel a real affinity uh, for the work of the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network um, tell us about uh, its work, some of the other resolutions that it has uh, uh, brought forward to the General Synods, uh, and what what's, lies ahead for the UCC PIN. Um, I'm trying to, I'm not sure where we started. I mean, we've had many resolutions. Uh, we had a resolution about the uh, unjustness of the wall, the illegal wall, the separation barrier, as the UN calls it. Um, we had that, uh, but that didn't happen with Penn. That came from Global Ministries. Right. Um, I think we came in with a boycott, divestment sanction type resolution. We named certain companies that were clearly um, benefiting uh, from the occupation. And we felt solid in naming them as the Presbyterians had done. 
and, and naming settlement products. And so we, um, Penn, I think began there. We were following, I would say, the lead of the Methodists and the Presbyterians on that. Um, I actually was a, a witness, or I don't know what to call it. I went to the um, Presbyterian uh, group that decides on their investments to testify that Caterpillar was still being used, uh, was weaponized and destroying olive trees. So that strange little photograph of me, and yeah. uh, it was to get the Caterpillar behind me because that was the evidence that they are still doing this terrible work. Um, so that was our first one. So we were kind of following along. Um, then we decided that focusing on children uh, would keep the conversation going. We, our goal was in part to always keep this on the table at our general assemblies, our general synods. And, and so the imprisonment and torture of children was we figured nobody could think this was good. This would be a win. Um, and it would not be that hard to pass. Um, and Betty McCollum, um, I think at the same time, was coming before Congress and bringing Congress and the country's attention to the use of uh, military aid that possibly could be used to basically um, commit these war crimes. And, and so we were able to pass that and to garner a lot of attention. So one of the things the Penn Group has done um, is to create materials then that go with the resolution once it's passed. So we made a film, How Are the Children? And we use footage from the Defense for Children and others, and, and, and it went all over the country. We've shown it here in Fort Wayne. Oh. And yes, the, I'm in there. <laughs> yeah, and Terrible, the, and the church yeah. where you'll be speaking tomorrow night, Plymouth Congregational, oh. was one of the twelve. Uh, what do you call it, originators? Co oh, co-signers or uh, supporters? Yeah, yeah, of the of oh, the resolution, okay. one of the first twelve. Yeah. So, so we, you know, this seems to be our our pattern. If we if the thing gets passed, how is it going to get into the churches? Because who cares in the end if you just pass a resolution if nothing happens? So we. Um, it, slightly different from the Presbyterians, maybe, or, or not. We decided that f actually making films was maybe a better way in than asking people to read a lot and follow curriculums. And, and so when we came to this one, um, and it has passed, we are following a similar pathway of using films, but this time theological conversations, sacred conversations that you are part of. And our hope is that by exploring them and people hearing uh, the theological, political conversations, this will help them understand better. We're going to shift gears yeah. again. Muhammad el Kurd oh. and Muna el Kurd, yeah. uh, the twins who entered the world stage in the last number of months, uh, as the face of activism and resistance in, in the East Jerusalem neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah, uh, were recently named to Time Magazine's annual list of the 100 most influential people in the world. You have a relationship with the Al-Kurd family. Yes. And with uh, Muhammad. T tell us about uh, your friendship with the family and with Muhammad. So it started by watching the film In My Neighborhood because the YWCA is in Sheikh Jarrah. And as I prepared uh, for my ministry post, I saw this little boy. I said, this is an extraordinary little child. I need to find him when I get there. So on Friday at one of the Sheikh Jarrah um, rallies. T t t hit pause for a second. Why are we rallying Sheikh Jarrah? Just give oh, the context sorry. of that. Yes, yeah. so the rally is because uh, Israel um, is, and the settlers are continuing to take homes, push Palestinians out of their homes by evicting them. They're not demolishing the homes because they want to live in them. And this is part of what people call the Judaization of Jerusalem. And Sheikh Shirah is a very old Palestinian neighborhood. It's also the neighborhood that after 1948, um, the UN placed refugee families there um, purposely in these homes, and there were agreements made 
that there are settler organizations largely funded by the United States saying, no, these homes belong to Jews prior to 1948. So their right of return is beating the Palestinians who have no right of return. Yeah. So it's, it's a flashpoint, and it's a very important one, because um, if Sheikh Shirah goes, and, and there's a lot of indications that it's just on the edge. It's teetering. The whole of Jerusalem will go, and, and we saw already um, that people will rise up um, to defend. So I met Mohammed uh, on the streets, and I recognized him from the film, and I said, could I interview you? Because I showed this film of you back home, and it would be nice to do a, like an update. And when I sat with him, within five minutes, I realized this is a poet. This is an extraordinary person. Yes, his English is mostly shaped by Marilyn Manson and Lady Gaga, which is very <laughs> odd. And listening to a lot of foreigners come, he, was, he had become the translator for his family. We recognized in each other that we were each poets. I don't know how else to describe it. And so even though I'm way older, um, we had this bond. And so we would meet um, once a week, if possible. I would make pesto pasta. That was his first meal that he learned to cook. And we would talk poetry. He would write. Sometimes we'd write together. Sometimes we'd read together. He introduced me to a lot of Mamwa Darwish poems. I introduced him to Pablo Neruda and things. And then over time, I realized he's about to graduate from high school. He needs to go somewhere for this gift to be taught. So I became sort of part of the family by helping him um, work through that whole process. And, um, and so um, a very wonderful, terrible memory is an iftar dinner when uh, the Gaza missiles somehow got through to Jerusalem and the air raid side, you know, sick thing went off. All the settlers in Sheikh Jarrah were running around crazy because they didn't have a panic room, a, a safe room, and they were looking for their mass. Now, Palestinians have none of this. And so I'm sitting there having dinner with the family. And I'm like, I'm from the duck and cover days. So I'm like, should I get under that mm -hmm. table? Um, nobody else seems to be worried. And then, you know, if it is written, it is written. Inshallah. Inshallah, you're going to die. And then I thought, is that really my theology? And then I thought, you know what? I don't have time to really think that through. <laughs> um, if I'm going to die in Jerusalem, okay, then that's that. And, and so um, the fact that I didn't panic, um, I think, endeared me. Uh, Riska, his grandmother, would always come up to me and like, again, staring at me to see if I was okay. And she said, you're American. And I knew that that was a bad way she said that. I said, I am, but I'm more than that. <laughs> you know, so that would always be my response. And I knew that I had won a tiny bit of her heart one day when she gave me a little piece of jasmine. And, and Muhammad's eyes got really big. He said, she never does that. So I don't know what you did. I said, I think I just... We just wore each other out. Yeah. Um, so I am so proud of them, and I'm particularly proud that of, of his many accomplishments as a, a, a spokesperson, not just for his generation, but for this uprising. And give a commercial for his latest work that yes. has just been published. And I have the book somewhere. Um, it's called Rivka, after his grandmother, and it's a collection of poems from Haymarket Press. Now what's unique about this, Haymarket has never published poetry before and never poetry by a Palestinian. And he convinced them that if you really care about these social political issues, you need to care for the writers who are writing about them. So it's a coup uh, in that level too. He's also now um, a correspondent for Nation Magazine. And um, and Muna is equally proficient writer, particularly in Arabic. So when they come together, and they are twins, and they were born on the Nakba, this revolution that we're in 
is this generation. Yeah. And they are speaking for it in both languages. Just a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned before um, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter. And you've, uh, uh, in, in part of your bio, you mentioned you're writing about immigrants and refugees based on your witness in San Diego, uh, the San Diego border. Oh, yeah. So, but I want to be broader than that. Talk about intersectionality, to use a buzzword, but Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ rights, uh, indigenous peoples, refugees and immigrants. Why is, why is this so important? I mean, maybe I'm just late to the game, but it's one of the things I've learned later in my life yeah. is the importance of all these justice and human rights movements working in tandem with each other, and including yeah. Palestinian rights. Well, let me just take the border. So before I went to the church in Rochester, I had some time. So I convinced um, the people in Global Ministries who hooked me up with the volunteer part of our denomination to go down and volunteer at the border. I wanted to see it. I wanted to see what's going on there. And I also wanted to see the wall. I had just spent, you know, five years uh, looking at another wall. Um, interesting enough, the same cement company used in both cases. I didn't know that. And the surveillance on our wall is gifted by Israel. So the intersection globally uh, from a capital standpoint, has already happened. There's a lot of uh, crossing of militarization of the police um, and also, on this case, the wall. Um, the young man who started the right of return marches in Gaza, whose name escapes me, um, he's been... Uh, he came to the United States on behalf of AFSC, and they took him around. I was in San Diego when he came. I was at the wall doing a, a Sunday service of communion when he came walking up, touching the wall. Oh, man. And I thought, oh, my God. And the birds that he talked about in Gaza, why he wanted the right of return, because the birds can go. He's looking at the birds here between San Diego side and the Mexican side. And he turned to me and he goes, I guess in this story, I'm the Mexican. And I thought, yeah, yeah, you, if you, your Palestinian identity is closer to the Mexican than it is, but you are now standing on the American side. That kind of intersectionality is at the heart of why we need to pay attention to it. It also shows up in George Floyd's murder. That knee on the neck is a tactic that the Israeli uh, border police have taught to many police in our country. It's outlawed, apparently, but the police in Minnesota and Minneapolis were trained by Israeli police. So when I saw that on the video, I had a kind of deja vu trauma response because I remember seeing this many times and many Palestinian young men have died this way. And so we have to deal with it in both places because it's, it's the dehumanization itself that has to be addressed, whether it is there or whether it is here. And, and so that's one of the ways this comes up. This beautiful um, cape is an example of another kind of intersectionality, of indigenous people of the land sh sharing their culture. And, and so it's not always um, a political statement. It is also appreciating um, the, the intersection of, of, in this case, uh, two cultures who have continuously been under threat of dispossession of their own land. Um, and, and so I think it is important for us, when we see it, to call it, to name it, and, and then do something about it. Um, and, and so it is kind of a new buzzword, I, I, I think. But for it to be real, you have to... Um, you can't just 
talk about Palestine and not talk about what's happening to particularly the African-American community here. I'll, I'll give you a personal example. In one of my talks in Ohio, and I, I want to say, oh, what was the town? It was a very unusual name, like Defense. Defiance. Oh, Defiance. Yeah, it was Defiance. I thought, what a great name. Yeah, the UCC College probably. Yes, Defiance yes. College. I was there. So uh, I was showing my slides, and I was talking about Palestinians being in prison for picking up a rock. And one of, there were a couple African-American, very big, strong-looking guys in the class. And I hadn't seen any blacks in town, and they were the football team. And I said, yeah, that you could get arrested just for holding the rock. And I heard this slap on the knee. He goes, damn, they have it worse than we do. And I asked the teacher, would she mind stepping out for a minute? And, and then I sort of pulled up my chair closer to them. They were all sitting in the back. I said, let's talk about that and what's happening to you. I said, I don't entirely know what's going on, but I think you're the only African-Americans in town. And they said, yeah, we're the football team. And you're able to go to college because you're able to do this. But tell me about what this was about. And he said, you know, the, the threat of being a black man in America, that you could be picked up anytime. They're terrified walking around this white town, which is why I asked the teacher to leave, because I wanted to get at that. So that, to me, is embodied intersectionality. Um, and strange that a white middle-class woman can have that conversation, and the only thing I have is my witness. Yeah. Um, and I try to use it respectfully um, because I, I, otherwise I really have no business talking about this except the commitment that it should not happen there and it should not happen here. Um, so We're, we're going to end where we started, and mm -hmm. that is with your story. You have, your life has been one of service and ministry, I mean, yeah. in many, many different uh, ways, different areas of the world seems to me that the, the constant has been the grounding in your faith, your faith journey, your faith life. Talk to us about how your commitment to your faith, and I'll let you describe it in your own terms, mm -hmm. has led you to this life of service. Well, hmm. I don't think I would describe my early engagement and politics as a faith journey. But I have always been um, interested in issues of justice and equality and inequality. Um, that has been a constant. And uh, for whatever reasons, which my mother tried to get out of me, that I didn't have to respond. I've always had to respond. And, and that goes way back. So when younger kids, little kids were being beat up by older boys, I was tough and uh, tall. I was tall early on and I, I would protect them. That whole thing has translated later in life to when I went to seminary, I thought I was going to get my little degree so I could go and be a nice hospital chaplain and do Reiki which was a pretty nonviolent, wonderful thing to be doing. But 9-11, the world fell apart, and we were about to go to war with Iraq. And my uh, anti-war activism got re-stoked. And so I built, um, with some uh, members of the church in Amherst, a labyrinth on the anniversary of September 11th of shoes to call attention to the injustice of the sanctions. I'm that person. The faith part of it is fairly recent. So I come to the scriptures and I read these stories about Jesus and um, where he was and who he stood with, the marginalized. And I am empowered by what he calls us to be and do. This has not always been that clear to me. Um, when I look back, my work with refugees was a ministry. I did not perceive it at the time. Absolutely. 
Um, so that's why I'm hesitant to claim that history too much. Because, uh, but now I see that God used me all along, and will continue to do so. And it's not just in the church with a collar on or preaching. It's wherever I am, um, and that's what my mother meant when she said, you are the same person, you just have a new vocabulary. Um, that's true. All right. It's a delight to have you here. It's great to, it's great to see you, and uh, thank you very much. Welcome. Cool.